Stock Compounders, Brad here. So today I want to share highlights from Rob Vinal's annual meeting. Okay, uh, this was a little over a week ago now. A lot of different things covered in this uh, Q&A with Rob Vinal. Rob is really one of the lesser followed super investors that I track. Uh, he's based in Switzerland, runs a, a firm called RV Capital. And yeah, uh, I love what he's doing. It, it, very crisp responses uh, to a lot of these questions that he got uh, in this Q&A and kind of answered them in ways that I haven't really thought about before. So excited to share some of these highlights with you today. So the first question he gets is, what do you think about talking to management? There's a lot of you know, folks in the value investing community who think, well, maybe we shouldn't talk to management, right? Because they're so charismatic. They're such great salespeople. Um, they're just going to win us over if we talk to them. And we're not going to be able to think rationally about the merits of the business. So Rob actually thinks about that very differently. Uh, he says, when you, you know, investors usually look at stocks as you know, ju just a bunch of quantitative factors, all right? But if you're a business owner, okay, and, and you, you're talking to other business owners, you realize it's all about the people, all right? So how are you gonna gauge the people? How are you gonna gauge management and the culture of the business uh, if you don't talk to management, right? If you don't talk to the CEO. So, um, you know, you really want to find that likable CEO. You want to find that CEO who's able to lead people, right? who's able to lead that business, a uh, competent leader, all right? So, so pretty early on in the process when Rob is sussing out potential investment opportunities, he wants to meet with management um, to, to really get that sense, that gut sense. Do I like this guy or, or girl, right? Do I think they have the ability to grow value for, for decades, hopefully. Um, so that's very important to him. He talks about financial success as an output, right? So really when you're looking at how the company is doing financially today, you know, that's, that's the scoreboard, all right? That tells you how they've executed in the past. What we really want to see is the scoreboard five or 10 years from now, depending on you know, how long we want to own the business. So those are outputs, right? The inputs are the people. The inputs uh, are the culture that the people create at the business. Uh, so for Rob, that's, that's really uh, quite essential to his investment thesis, really getting a sense for that culture, getting a sense for the management team. Um, let's see. He says the correct way to invest is to find companies that are solving an important problem and can survive through surprises, right? They're anti-fragile. So no business goes up in a straight line. Uh, business is, is messy, right? Uh, companies exceed people's expectations. It falls short. There's there are headwinds. There are tails with tailwinds. Uh, it's not a straight line. So um, that's something to keep in mind, and, and that's why Rob talks about sell decisions. Right? How does he decide when to sell a business? Uh, he says. I sell that my, my best sell decisions have been when, you know, I've realized something about the company that really puts a dent in my investment thesis, right? And he talks about Baidu in this situation where, you know, search results, Baidu was, was putting ads into search results, right? As if they were organic results, they were kind of hiding the fact that they were advertisements and that just destroys trust with the customers. Um, so, and he's also realized when he's made sell decisions because he thinks the company has gotten a little bit expensive, it's gotten a little bit ahead of itself in terms of the valuation, uh, great businesses have a tendency to surprise to the upside, okay? So it may look expensive, 
Uh, but if it's a great business, you know, really where he's at today, he just wants to hold on. All right, let that business execute. Because, um, you know, if you get out, if you make these decisions um, to kind of micromanage great companies, thinking you know when to get in and get out, uh, you can really miss a great opportunity to compound with those great businesses. And that's really one of the biggest mistakes uh, we can make as investors is uh, sabotaging that process of compounding. Um, how do you deal with fear of failure? I, I really like this question. Um, obviously, business, you know, there, there's investing, particularly. Um, even if you think you've done all the work that you can possibly do on a business, something can come out of left field and the business can fail. So, you know, managing the, that emotional state around failure is, is incredibly important. Uh, Rob says, I use fear to my advantage, which I was like, hmm, I never really would have thought about it that way. I use fear to my advantage. I buy the kinds of companies that allow me to sleep well at night. Okay, so if if Rob is having these uneasy feelings at night, he can't sleep very well because there's this company in the portfolio that he's just, you know, he can't get comfortable with. That tells him something, right? Should he really own that business? Uh, allow your emotional response to things to guide you, right? Uh, not sleeping at night, not looking forward to meeting a certain management team. Well, you know, that should probably tell him something about whether or not he should own those businesses. He's asked about Meta, right? He owns Facebook. Just I'll take a quick peek here. RV Capital. Th these are the holdings, uh, the U.S. ticker holdings as of the end of last year. Uh, credit acceptance, Salesforce, Meta. Meta is a pretty decent position, right? 20% of what we can see here from the 13F filings. There are a number of companies he mentions in this talk which aren't in these 13F filings, right? There's a New Zealand company, I think there's a German company, there's uh, companies all over the world that Rob is invested in. But you can see here Facebook uh, pretty high up on the list in terms of allocation. So he's asked about Meta. Uh, Rob was a telecoms analyst in the late 90s. That's interesting. That's, you know, a, a, a rare perspective to be able to approaching something like the metaverse from uh, all, the, all this technological innovation. My strong guess is that the metaverse will be a thing, but we can't predict what it will look like. All right. Well, that's, that's challenging from the perspective of an investor. Um, the thing that makes it less challenging in the case of Facebook is meta, the metaverse is really an option for Rob. Okay? It doesn't have to work out uh, in order for Rob's investment in meta to, to do well. He says, if the price of Facebook was dependent on meta working out, he wouldn't own it. Um, if you back out the spending on the metaverse, Facebook is currently trading at a 10 times earnings multiple, okay, 10 times price to earnings. So it's incredibly cheap, right, for the uh, incredible digital advertising product uh, that it offers. So that's where, oh, I want to mention this point. One of Facebook's weaknesses is that the operating systems are controlled by other companies, all right? You've got the iPhone controlled by Apple, of course. And you've got the Android ecosystem controlled by Google. So, you know, it's kind of an aha moment here, which I probably should have had earlier. But uh, Facebook wants, it sounds like part of this play in the metaverse, it wants to control its operating system. Okay, it kind of missed out on that um, with Web 2. And it doesn't want to make that same mistake with Web 3. So that is perhaps part of the... Um, you know, the reason that Facebook is, is driving so hard towards the metaverse. 
putting so much spending behind it. Um, how much does, does management stock ownership factor into your judgment, right? There's a lot of investors, including myself, who pay very close attention to, you know, insider ownership, uh, particularly with the CEO. Well, you know, in the case if it's a CEO founder, how much skin in the game do they have? Um, and so this person is asking, Rob, how much of a factor is that for you? Um, I try to align myself with business owners. Okay, the, this fund in RV Capital is called the Business Owners Fund. Um, so Rob really wants to invest in businesses where the management team, the CEO, treats that business like it's an owner, right? Not just a vehicle to funnel paychecks um, to itself. I like to see the CEO as founder or major shareholder. Okay, that's kind of the, the best case scenario. Uh, that's not always the case. Um, but if that's not the case, I like to see someone with a significant stake uh, as a percentage of, of stock outstanding um, kind of in the C-suite or the board of directors, uh, someone who can, you know, guide the ship who's got, you know, a reasonable amount of skin in the game. He's asked about management selling. He says, management selling doesn't bother me much. Usually it's a small percentage uh, as compared to their overall stake. And he made a good point. He says, you know, if you're spending decades building a business, um, at some point you're, you're probably going to want to convert some of that into cash to pursue some other interests. Right? I think you've earned that, right? Um, so selling doesn't bother him. Um, it, it's just kind of part of the game as, as Rob sees it. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I haven't, I've probably put too much emphasis when I see, you know, maybe the CEO, the CFO selling. Um, Pabrai has pointed out in the past, there's really only one reason that someone buys a stock, right? Someone uh, buys or adds to their position. There's many reasons for selling, right? People need cash. People want cash for a variety of reasons, different investment opportunities. There's all kinds of things. So probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to put much um, weight on sales, especially when they're a small percentage of the total holding. Uh, how has your view changed on Chinese ADRs? I don't think there have been any developments over the last couple of months. Um, and Rob, I don't think it was the last letter. Maybe it was the one before that, the first half year, 2021. He talked a lot about China, uh, particularly his investments in Alibaba and Prosis. So definitely worth checking out if you guys haven't read that and you're interested in China. Um, Prosis, he mentions, is a South African company. Former, you know, Naspers is, is where it all started. Uh, that made a large investment in Tencent 20 years ago when it was a tiny company. Okay. Uh, today, Tencent is one of the largest companies in the world and probably the single most important company in China. Process has virtually never sold any of its shares. Uh, it still owns 29% of Tencent. The Tencent stake alone is worth 115 billion euros okay, to Process. Uh, the process market cap is 70 billion euros. And of course, it has a portfolio of other companies on top of Tencent. It's not just Tencent. So that's, that's pretty compelling from a value perspective, right? You've got uh, process that trades at something like a 39% discount to just the Tencent holding. Uh, and it, it's it's difficult. It's difficult to, to do the math on this. Uh, if you look up process on something like ticker, uh, it does not give the right market cap. So scroll down. It says the market cap is 130 billion euros. 
it's actually around 70 billion, okay? Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a complex structure with NASPERS and PROSYS. There's some cross-holdings. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, I just reached out to the PROSYS investor relations team. I think it was around six months ago they sent me kind of a summary of the net uh, shares outstanding for PROSYS. Um, so I'm, I'd like to get an update on that figure since they've been doing buybacks over the last six months or so. So hopefully um, tomorrow or the next day I'll have that. If you want to see that, send me a message on Twitter, a DM, and I can forward that along to you as well. Just so you can uh, more easily calculate what the market cap of Prosys is compared to that uh, 10 cent holding. So, um, and of course, then he says, I think it's a valuation which is totally crazy, talking about process. I own process, full disclosure. None of this is investment advice. Um, but I agree with Rob. It, it seems pretty crazy. But of course, whenever something seems crazy, uh, it, it reasons to, uh, to think there must be some reason for that, right? Because it's possible I'm missing something. Maybe the market isn't crazy. There's a reason for it that I'm that I'm not seeing. Uh, and he says one of the reasons given is there's an increased nervosity, <laughs> nervous, uh, about the robustness of ownership rights in China, especially given everything that has happened in Russia. Uh, and Rob goes into kind of Russia versus China, how. You know, I view Russia and China as very different things. Um, Rob has spent quite a bit of time in China. I don't know that he's ever been to Russia, um, but his impression of Russia is that it's effectively a mafia state. Whereas, um, so Putin has done nothing for his people in terms of quality of life. Life expectancy has declined. Poverty has not improved. So that's the situation as Rob sees it in Russia. China was a struggling third world country 40 years ago, uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, it's on track to becoming the largest economy in the world. Okay, so it's a very different story from uh, what has happened in Russia. Uh, how has your view of moats changed over time? This was a fascinating question. Um, number one, I don't think all moats are created equal. And that's, you know, I don't, I don't know that anyone would think that they are, but one of Rob's big points from his last letter that really jumped out at me is that some moats can actually be uh, a negative in terms of the long-term value creation of a company. And I'll get into that. So low cost advantage is big. That's an important moat. That's a moat that um, Rob would, would really value, kind of in the pros column. Uh, the lower the cost, the more value you can pass on to customers, right? It's this whole uh, shared economies scaled concept uh, that Amazon works on, that Costco works on, Walmart works on. Um, you know, you, you just really can't compete with a great business that has a low cost advantage, right? They can produce things for, for lower than any of their competitors. That's a, a very difficult moat to, um, to cross. Switching cost moat, um, the moat that makes it hard for customers to leave, that can actually be a negative for a business um, because the company can take customers for granted right? The companies are in a way kind of locked in, right? They don't have any other options that are attractive to them because it's just such a big hassle to, to switch to a different company. Uh, but Rob thinks that that really sets the seeds of disruption in place, right? Company can get lazy. They kind of stop caring as much about their customers. They don't feel the need to innovate. They can really rest on their laurels uh, if they have this kind of high switching moat in place. 
And of course, you know, with, with that deterioration, um, it, it sets the stage for disruption. Uh, so that's, that's the first point. Not all moats are created equal. The second, the world is changing so fast that by far the most important thing to look for in a company is the ability to adapt, right? The ability to innovate. Uh, is a wide moat conducive or antagonistic to innovation, right? That's an important question. Wide moats can make it hard for companies to have an obsessive focus on the customer. Um, so that makes a lot of sense to me, and I, I haven't quite thought about it that way, at least before reading Rob's last letter to his uh, business owners. Uh, it's something I'm going to be thinking a lot more about a as I look at different investment opportunities. Where is the moat here, and is that moat actually a long-term advantage to the company, or is it something that can make the company lazy? over time. Um, and this is a really important point. The inputs of constant improvement drives the long-term success of a company. Moats are really just a byproduct of that constant improvement, that innovation, that uh, insatiable desire to serve your customers better day after day. Okay, that's, that's really the input that drives this, this long-term success. Uh, the moats just kind of come, maybe go as a result of that, maybe new moats pop up, um, but perhaps the moats aren't the thing to focus on. It's that culture. Is, is the culture uh, really well constructed, well positioned to serve the customers over a very long period of time? Um, okay, last one, last thing I'm going to talk about here is Ryman Healthcare. So I, I hadn't heard of Ryman Healthcare. I guess it's one of uh, the companies that RV Capital owns. Rob says, it's one of my favorite companies in the world, if not my favorite. Okay, big statement there from Rob Vinal. They have the most incredible mission that I've ever come across taking care of mom and dad when they can no longer take care of themselves. Okay, so this is like retirement communities, retirement villages. Um, it's a business which across the world is completely dysfunctional, right? Uh, people, as they get older, they try so hard, they fight so hard to stay at home, right? To not end up in a retirement home because I think it's pretty well accepted, at least in the U.S., uh, that once you go to a retirement home, that's really the beginning of the end. Uh, most retirement homes, they take care of the needs, the physical needs of, you know, the, the people who live there, but that's about it, okay? And I've visited these places, right? And my, my grandmother was in uh, a retirement home in Wisconsin, and they're very, they're, it was a sad place to visit. Okay, uh, it just it felt like that's where people go to die, all right. And obviously, it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, and Ryman has taken a very different approach. Uh, created a Disney-like experience in their villages, fun, love, friendship, things happening, right. You think of Disney World. I mean, I went to Disney World multiple times as a child, and it's just a magical experience, right? It, it's phenomenal. There, there's fun and excitement around every corner. Uh, and and why, why couldn't that be created for, you know, people entering kind of the last phase of life? He says, visiting is one of the most moving experiences you can imagine. This is visiting... Uh, one of these villages uh, that Ryman has in New Zealand. It's a New Zealand company. Uh, taking care of the elderly is one of the biggest unmet needs in society. This is something I've thought about a lot. Um, you know, historically in, in human cultures, uh, elders were 
highly regarded, right? They were revered for their wisdom. Uh, you, you'd have the kind of circle of tribal elders at the center of the community. Uh, and it's really sad how that's, you know, for, for whatever reason, over the generations, maybe it's fear of death. We, we just don't want to witness uh, people deteriorating as they get older. We want to kind of separate ourselves from that process. Um, but it needs to change in a big way. And it's awesome to see that there's a company like Ryman Healthcare who's actively creating a, a totally different model um, for what aging looks like. Um, he, he gets the, so the question about Ryman was around inflation. Uh, so what he says is it's exceptionally well suited to inflation and uh, an environment of higher interest rates. The best type of business to own in a increasingly inflationary environment is a capital light business. He says, once these villages are built, Ryman retains ownership of the village, but sells an occupation right uh, to the residents. The resident pays money to Ryman and in return gets the right to stay in the village for however long they need to, right? Until they die or they just need a whole different level of care that can't be provided um, by Ryman. Um, so Ryman participates in the appreciation of property value, but doesn't carry the capital. Okay, so you have a capital light business model here in Ryman uh, that Rob thinks is, is well positioned uh, in this potentially higher inflation environment that we're kind of moving into. Um, so I'm definitely planning on digging deeper into Ryman Healthcare. If you guys have any resources, uh, hit me up at Twitter. Send me a direct message. I would love to learn more about that company. And I think I'll leave it there, guys. A big shout out to Rob Vinall for, for making this session available to the public, right? For putting it out on his YouTube channel. Uh, I really respect Rob Vinall as an investor, kind of his, the way he thinks about investing. Um, and Monish Pabrai gave him a shout out. I think just a couple Q and A sessions ago, someone asked, you know, who are some young managers uh, that you clone or that you kind of follow what they're doing in 13F filings to hopefully get some new ideas. And Rob Vinall was one of maybe two or three that Monish Pabrai uh, called out by name. So, um, yeah, definitely watch the whole talk if you haven't already. I watched it on one and a half times speed, and that was perfectly fine to kind of get everything. Um, so there's a little tip for you. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Take care.